Okay. So, um, basically, the the problem is that there's a shortage of canon lawyers in Canada. So, what the defender of the bond is supposed to do is to make reasonable mm -hmm. arguments yeah. in favour of the bond. Mm -hmm. But in practice, um, the parties almost never have their own advocates, which is bad. The other problem we have <coughs> is because people are not familiar with how canon law works, how it deals with the, with the contradictorium, how the parties' different ver versions meet, right? how they're con contrasted. Very few people read the Acts, because most people in Canada are used to how it works in the civil courts, where one party stands up and gives evidence orally, and then the lawyer for the other party asks, asks that party questions in cross-examination. Uh, we don't do that when we interview people the person who's interviewing is the judge or a representative. Mm -hmm. And the differences between the versions are supposed to show up when people read the Acts, but about 5% do. Um, so what the Defender of the Bond actually does in Canada is he or she goes through the file and tries to establish what he or she thinks happened, if that's possible. If there are problems with the procedure, the defender of the bond will be the only canon lawyer, apart from the judge, of course, who looks at the case. And I've given in my little memo examples of where the procedure often goes wrong. Uh, one that happens occasionally is it becomes obvious later on in the case that the grounds need to be changed. But canon law does not allow the judge to do that by himself somebody has to ask for it and if the if what is needed is to remove a ground then the defender of the bond can ask for that so that we don't have to bother the parties right? but if a ground needs to be added the defender of the bond cannot ask for that so therefore the defender of the bond if he or she thinks the grounds need to be changed has to ask the judge could you please ask one of the parties to ask to have this ground added? Mm. Okay. But the biggest problem for which there's no solution <clears throat> is the violent respondent. Until uh, probably five years ago, or maybe more, longer ago, in Canada there was a practice of not citing or notifying the violent respondent if the tribunal believed that um, the applicant, the petitioner, had uh, proven that um, the respondent would injure or kill the applicant or the applicant's friends or children. But the appeal tribunal in Ottawa st stopped permitting that. So with um, Father Andre's permission, or maybe it was Father J.R., I forget, Anyway, with the, approve, the permission of the, vic, of the judicial vicar, um, we wrote, uh, I wrote a, a, a letter to the signatura saying, is this allowed or not? Mm -hmm. Do we have to cite the violent respondent? And they sent back a very helpful letter, um, because they'd obviously been asked this before, saying, yes, you have to. Um, and that is a very real problem. Um, the signatura does allow us to hide the address and contact information of the petitioner from the respondent. But if the respondent is violent, they usually know where the petitioner lives. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's a very serious problem. Um, one thing that some defenders don't realise is that Although the defender is like a party and has some of the rights of a party and even some rights that a party does not have, uh, for example, to be present in interviews, although I hardly ever do that, 
The defender is not supposed to use his or her powers to, quote, win, unquote, a case. The defender is a public official. All the defender is supposed to do is to appeal or object or whatever if <clears throat> the result that the court has come to is in unsupportable. So if the defendant uh, doesn't agree with the decision of the judge, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is if, <clears throat> if the judge could not have come to that conclusion, there's no evidence at all, then the defender is, is justified in, in appealing or objecting. Um, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of defenders, they kind of get married to the case, right? So if it goes a way they don't like, um, they appeal to mm -hmm. win. Yeah. But there's no win mm -hmm. because the defender isn't a party, right? Um, one of the problems we've had is that because of the shortage of canon lawyers, nobody has an overview of all the evidence. So typically we will have lots of different auditors interviewing different parties. And what the problem with that is that important things never get um, found out. Um, and the, the biggest problems we have is that the names of children, the relative ages of parties and witnesses don't come out. And the reason that matters is the, rel the relative age of the parties and witnesses, particularly if the, par if the witnesses are brothers or sisters, if there's too great an age difference, often the evidence of the witness will not be very valuable. So if somebody gets married at 21 or 25 or something, mm -hmm. and the brother or sister who's giving us evidence is 10 years younger, then they, they know much less than, than they would if they were two or three years younger. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, particularly female witnesses date events by the age of children. Okay, yeah. They will say this happened when the children were, when a child was five or six or something. <clears throat> if we don't know the names of the children mm -hmm. and when they were born, um, then we essentially have no idea when this happened. Now, uh, the, the instruction in Dignitas Canubii has forbidden a defender of the bond from being the person who assists people when they first approached the tribunal. Until that happened, um, I was for some years the person who did initial intake, what Joan Myers now does. But that's now forbidden. Mm -hmm. And what I used to do was they would uh, send me a summary, right? And then I would ask them lots of questions to give the information about um, the names of the children, when the children were born, to try to get concrete facts in the summary, right? Yeah. But unfortunately, <clears throat> I, I can't do that. Now, there are two schools of thought on this. The first one is mine, which is we need to put that in the summary in case it never gets asked in interviews. And the other approach is you don't want to tell the petitioner what, what to do. It's the petitioner's summary. So my solution to that is to have the petitioner write a summary and then have stuff added to it rather than alter what the petitioner's written. And that's my solution to it. Um, often crucial um, facts are not put in the file because the people who do the interviews forget that the file will be read in Regina or elsewhere in the tribunal, mm -hmm. but it will also be read in Ottawa. Okay, and it, yeah. it may be read in Rome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what I do is, if there's something that's specific to Saskatchewan or specific to Canada, and it wouldn't be obvious to somebody in Rome, I explain it in my observations. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is the defender cannot 
cannot add evidence. But what I do is I put in information in my observations and if the judge wants to reopen the case and add information, he's welcome to do so. Uh, I have an extreme example of observations where I did that. Perhaps we could we could go through this. Okay. Sure. okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, now this is an extreme example. What this case was really about was whether the uh, plaintiff is what we would call in English a nut. Is she crazy? Right? <laughs> Not as in locked up, mm -hmm. but does she have no grasp of reality okay. with men? Okay. It turned out she was financially helping and getting involved in a, a medical doctor who was 70 years old. This is when she was doing the case, right? Mm -hmm. This man has been removed from medical practice by the College of Physicians, so he's lost his license. Okay. But all this was hinted at in the, in the file. But what they did tell us, what Saskatoon told us, is who this man is. And his name was Dr. Carlos Huerto. So what I did was, I went on to the, the website of the College of Physicians and Surgeons. If you turn to page 103, like right this. Okay. And I did screen grabs from the college. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I had uh, pages of this stuff, and what it showed was that, um, and from the, the college and various news reports, that this man has been removed from the practice of medicine, and he keeps trying to get in, he keeps going to the courts, to get an order that he, be, that he get his license back. Mm -hmm. okay? Well, that doesn't happen. Um, he keeps doing it, and he keeps losing. Right? <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, um, so if you put, turn to page 107, okay. the obvious argument in favour of, of an affirmative is that plaintiff's blindness to the reality of men is the same in her approach to Dr. Huerto as it was to our respondent. And then I explain that in fact that's not true. But if I were an advocate for the, respond uh, for the, uh, for, uh, for the uh, petitioner, I would be saying, um, this lady has no idea how men work. Um, she has no grasp of reality. Mm -hmm. And this is the same blah, blah, blah. So, um, and of course, if she has no grasp of reality, her evidence is useless. Uh, but I don't think that's true. But to my mind, the obvious question any judge would ask is, what is going on? Who is this man? Is, um, is this lady crazy? <laughs> and one principle I use is um, because of the shortage of canon lawyers, I want to make sure that the judge doesn't have to do all over again what I've already done. Okay? That's a waste of the judge's time. Because if you think about it, there's a shortage of canon lawyers, but there's an even greater shortage of priests who are canon lawyers. And there's an even greater shortage of Ukrainian priests who are canon lawyers, right? So, <clears throat> Father Andre is, there are very, very few Ukrainian Catholic priests who know canon law. Yeah. So, one of, as a lay person, <clears throat> what I'm supposed to do is assist the judge, right? Mm -hmm. If the judge doesn't take, pay any attention to what I say, that's fine. I mm -hmm. don't care, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, if I get a word I didn't know, this word Dogen, I had no idea what it meant. And they certainly wouldn't know what it meant in Rome. So what I did was I clipped something from, a, from, a, um, from a, uh, uh, an online dictionary. Um, I often will say that uh, I have no idea what happened. And I'll, but what I will do is I'll try to explain in my view, whether it's possible to find out and how one might wish to do that. And the reason I, I, I don't often don't know what happened is the, um, God provides the graces to people that they need to do what they do. Right? 
So I will receive graces to help <coughs> me do what I do, mm -hmm. but I'm not the judge. So the fact I don't know what happened doesn't matter, mm -hmm. because the judge will receive assistance from God where needed to do whatever the judge does. And the other great thing about canon law is, unlike the civil system, um, you can't get an annulment on one judgment, right? The system, uh, canon law, is much more humble as to how we find things out, how we decide things. The civil law, the basic principle in Canada is, you have a trial, mm -hmm. which is like first instance. Yeah. If nobody appeals, that's it. End of story, right? We don't do that. Mm -hmm. We are much also, uh, usually, in theory, we're supposed to have a panel of three judges. We don't because we have a shortage, right? Yeah. So canon law is basically saying that it's much more humble in truth finding than the civil law is. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that fits in with the civil law ancestors of canon law, which has come from the French Revolution. And that's a long story. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on to a less um, a less lengthy one. The next one, Franco Amis. Okay. Um, I'm not allowed to argue in favour of the bond. In fact, the appeal tribunal in one case said that I had come very close to arguing in favour of the bond and that as a result I had come very close to making the entire case a nullity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what I am allowed to say <clears throat> is after carefully reading the Acts, I did not find a reasonable argument to make in favour of the bond on either party which is basically a way of saying, I don't think the marriage was valid, but I'm not actually saying that. Yeah, okay. yeah in their different ways. Yeah. Right. You wrote oh. in different ways. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm great, but I found the following things um, you often get no confirmation of. Adultery. People, honest people will lie about anything to do with sex and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there are weird things going on in the marriage, particularly weird sexual things, there will be no confirmation. Um, but there's jurisprudence from the Rota, I think, from the nineteen twenties, saying that you can have you can have a, a, a judgment, you can have a sentence based on the a, a party's evidence backed by evidence that the party is truthful, okay? So, if there's no confirmation, that's, that's not fatal. Okay, let's have a look. If I come across a word I don't know and I can't find out, I say so. So this is quite, um, uh, this is very short. Also, I try to make it light, if possible. If there's something which is humorous but won't be offensive, then... I pointed out. And the reason for that is uh, none of this stuff is fun, right? I mean, none of the cases are sources of happiness. So the least I can do is try and lighten it a little bit for the judge. Okay, if we pass on to the next, <coughs> the next one, which is Old Port Frank. Mm -hmm. okay. Pope John Paul II, I think it was, he gave a very important speech to the Rotal Auditors. Um, in which he said that 1095.2 requires a grave anomaly. Um, and he also, somewhere else, had a very interesting speech saying that the Pope is not bound by the forms of law. So technically, speech by the Pope to the rotal auditors is not a law. But in practice, it should be treated as a law because the Pope is not bound by his own process, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the most important facts about, about the Church and canon law, which some people don't understand, that the Pope is not bound by his own law. Okay? Uh, in the civil world, there's a range from 
countries where the government is not bound by its own law at all to countries where the government is completely bound by its own law and if it wants to change something important it has to get approval from the people to change the constitution. Mm -hmm. The problem is that men, most English speaking canon lawyers are American and Americans don't realise that the rest of the world is not like the US. <laughs> yeah, it's true, yeah. They have their own constitution mm -hmm. and they are towards the end of the spectrum where if you want to change something serious you have to change the constitution. They aren't quite as far in that direction as some countries in Europe are, but Americans they have mental indigestion with the idea that you can have a legal system like canon law, but the, the legislator isn't bound by his own law. They can't digest that. It doesn't make sense to them. But it's still, still true. Okay. Um, on Alport Frank, uh, if I can't find any indication that there's a grave anomaly, then, then I will say so. And what that means is that the judge, <coughs> or judges, will say how he or they see it. And most of the time, what they say convinces me that I'm wrong. And the reason for that is very important. The only person who can be a sole judge is a priest with a canon law degree, or, or an indult. Right? The reason that matters is, People say to priests things they don't say to anybody else. So therefore, the priest knows a whole area of life where a non-priest doesn't. Right? So the fact that I can't see a grave mm -hmm. anomaly, mm -hmm. that is possibly interesting, but it's not determinative. Right? This has happened many times. Father Andre has a greater understanding of... Um, of human nature in areas that priests know about, obviously, than I do. Right? So if I say I'm going to, I reserve my right of appeal, he writes a judgment or somebody else does, I read through it, and usually it come, becomes obvious that through his, not, his, his different knowledge of human nature, he understands it better than I do. In which case, uh, my response to the judgment is, I have no objection to an affirmative. Right? So that, that very often happens. And again, this brings back the fact that the defender of the bond should not be married to his case. If the judge doesn't agree with the defender of the bond, whoopee. If the, if the judge has, has come to perfectly reasonable conclusions, that's fine. A canon law has moved from a very rigid assessment of the evidence under the 1917 Code to the same standard as they use in Europe, a free evaluation of the evidence. In other words, basically the legislator is saying that the judge is assumed to be sensible. And this again is a difference with civil law. Mm -hmm. The civil law in Canada starts from the basis that facts are decided by a jury. Okay? We don't have juries in canon law. Yeah. In the civil law, the civil law starts from the assumption that the jury is stupid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are endless rules which make no sense as to how the civil judge can stop a jury hearing things. Right? But we have a free evaluation of the evidence. And the safeguard we have, or we're supposed to have, we have a panel of three judges, right? Yeah. So that means that the judge is entitled um, to come to, to his own conclusion. The judgment of the sentences are very, caref very carefully starred in the pontificate of whoever, um, with Sonsa being the bishop moderator of the tribunal, <clears throat> having uh, invoked the holy name or something similar, and having only um, God before, before my eyes, I write this. Right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, when the judge decides that he has reached moral certitude, that is between him, his conscience, and God. That's what free evaluation means. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. 
Um, one of the biggest problems with 1095-2, in my opinion, is it, it speaks to capacity to discern. Was there something interfering with the ability to, to discern? It often, often what happens is people are perfectly capable of discerning but can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I will often say, well, I reserve my right of appeal because um, I, th I can't see any reason why this person couldn't have discerned, but they didn't bother. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, that will be a case where the judge, because as a priest he knows parts of the human soul that I don't, will say, no, there was, there was an, a, an, an, inability, a, 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 an inability to discern. So, um, that's what I think happened here, that essentially uh, this man was basically lazy, uh, he didn't. He didn't bother. He just did. He just winged it, right? Okay. <coughs> now I made a little <coughs> comment, which I probably shouldn't have, that this was a perfect case for using something the Orthodox do, but we don't, where you go to the bishop and you say, "My marriage didn't work. Can you allow me to enter a non-sacramental marriage?" Now the irony is that has been in the Eastern churches for century. Right? The Ukrainians used to have that, but then it got squashed. R Rome wouldn't allow it. So one of the tragedies to me of when the, the churches broke apart in the Great Schism in 10, whatever it was, is that um, the Eastern approach to things, which is less legalistic and more, to me, more humane, um, disappeared. I mean, if ever there was a case when you would go to your bishop and say, look, this didn't work. Can you allow me to enter a non-sacramental marriage? This would be it. But a Catholic bishop wasn't allowed to do that, unfortunately. So I said that, maybe I shouldn't have. But anyway, that's what I said. <laughs> yeah. And if we move to the next one, this is the Ukrainian case, but the canon law is almost exactly the same. This was so obvious that um, I had to prove I'd read it. Yeah. <laughs> Another reason why... As far as it can be a complete nullity is if the appeal tribunal comes to the conclusion that the defender of the bond never read the case. So I have a checklist of things. Toxic family background, violence, mm -hmm. alcohol, whatever. Mm -hmm. okay? All these things. Now, <clears throat> the signature um, gets very unhappy if people call these things presumptions that if any of these things occur, there's a presumption that the um, there's a presumption that the case is invalid. They jump up and down and say the only person who can make presumptions is the legislator. But if these things turn up, um, I mean we've seen this before, right? Mm -hmm. Now one thing you will have noticed, which most people in Canada who were brought up in Canada or Europe won't, is this is a culture that keeps people children very long, right? People used to be adults at 16 or 18, right? Yeah. But our culture uh, is such, is such that they, be, they remain immature much, much longer. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, the minimum age for validity of marriage is extremely young, and the Conference of Catholic Bishops says for lyceity, for a licit marriage, licit marriage, people aren't supposed to get married before 18. But in my opinion, um, a lot of people who are 25 are not capable of getting married, right? I can't say that because I'm not allowed to, right? But that's how it, how it seems to me. Um, oh, what have we got? Yeah, and then... I know some people, you know, the uh, 25 or 30... But their minds still like um, minor. Yeah, they, that's they, right. You know, immature. I would say that. Yeah. One of the reasons for that is we have because we're mu we're multicultural in this in this country. Yeah. Um, you often get a lot of um, differences between the subcultures, and I, in the little memo I discussed that. I call it the cultural defense. 
So you've got the natural law, which the church says, you know, this is the nat natural law. And if it will often happen that somebody from a subculture, from mm. an Im immigrant culture, what they do is perfectly reasonable in their culture, but it wouldn't be in the majority culture. Yeah. And I will often make that argument saying that these people come from a different culture and what they did is reasonable in their culture and therefore there was no problem with the marriage, right? Yeah. But there are certain areas where the natural law says that that isn't allowed. You can't say that. One example would be um, violence towards children. The, the church is not, is not going to say, because you're Romanian or Ukrainian or something, you're allowed to beat your children up. Right? Mm -hmm. So the cultural defense, and when, one area where this shows up a lot is dating. A lot of people in the majority culture have no idea that <clears throat> the process of man and woman getting to know each other and marrying in Canada is completely abnormal. In, mm -hmm. the, in the world at, at large, right? Yeah. They have no idea that's true. So if they're in a culture where that doesn't happen, um, to my mind, it's not a legitimate argument to say the marriage can't be valid because they didn't date long enough, right? Okay. Um, and that's what I discuss in this next case, Burgess Strugari. These people were um, Romanian Orthodox. So I tried to uh, explain um, two rules of thumb that we're not supposed to be tribal, right? By which I mean that we're not supposed to impose um, the views of the majority culture on, on other cultures unless it's outside the natural law. Um, okay. Now, often we will get uh, we'll often get a fact pattern where people consider that they have to get married uh, because the parents booked the hall and invited all the guests, etc., etc. Um, and that's what I call the toxic version of Canon 1080 which is the Omnia Parati, you can get a dispensation, or a permission, I think it's a dispensation. If everything is ready, you can get a dispensation under certain circumstances. It's as if people feel that they're on a train, and the train has left the station, and they aren't allowed to get off. So... Um, If you turn to page 76, item M, mm -hmm. a legitimate example of different cultures, different customs in different cultures, namely differing approaches to semi-public displays, displays of affection. Um, and then I got a word I never heard of, so I put an entry on that. So what I would say, in, in summary, is uh, the defender of the bond is supposed to provide another light, another view of the case, and to assist the, the judge, to avoid the judge having to do the work the defender's already done. The defender should not be married to his case. He has a very high chance of being wrong. In fact, I have lost all the appeals <laughs> I have made. <laughs> Uh, quite a few cases where I didn't have a problem, the appeal tribunal has, has given a negative, right? Yeah. Well, I don't care. It's very, very similar to the public prosecutor in the civil law, right? mm -hmm. the Crown Counsel, Crown Attorney, whatever. Um, the Crown Counsel or Crown Attorney is supposed to put the prosecution's case, right? But he or she is not supposed to appeal because he lost. You know? mm -hmm. He's only supposed to appeal if the judge or the jury went crazy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I see it as the, as the same thing. Um, I also make very sure to write to fit the person who's reading the case.
case, right? Yeah. Because the judge is the customer. That's the person I'm working for, right? For instance, Father Richard Arsenault in Winnipeg, he enjoys my jokes. Okay. So I'll put jokes in, right? Okay. He enjoys weird details. Mm -hmm. Because if it's depressing for me to read about ruined marriages for 15 years, right? It must be even worse for the judge. For the judge. Um, there's one judge in uh, uh, Ontario. He's very, very serious, right? A very learned man. He has a doctorate. And I would never put any judge for him. Right? <laughs> okay, serious, serious he, man. He, yeah. And Father Andre, his basic, he's very practical, right? Okay. Yeah. His basic approach is um, give me the highlights, right? And if I, if I oppose an affirmative, what I will very often do is I will have a summary under one page at the beginning, right? Yeah. And say, this is what I think went on, and then I'll prove what I think went on at great length in the rest of the observations. The reason I do that is if the judge reads the summary mm -hmm. and he thinks, this is nonsense, I'm not interested, he doesn't have to read the rest of it, right? Yeah. And if I appeal, which I usually don't, I don't have to write a separate appeal. Mm -hmm. I appeal for the ground for the reason, whatever, right? So, um, I'm, I don't think, I think essentially what I'm supposed to do is to, it's a bit like taking a portrait photo, right? Yeah. You, two lights is better than one. Um, but it's very, very important that the, that the defender of the bond doesn't take himself or herself too seriously. We're doing serious work, yes, but... Um, you know, I don't, the, whole, the whole structure of the canon law process in trials is humility. Correct, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the I whole... Agree, yeah. Com, yeah. And that comes from continental Europe. Um, essentially, the government of France, before the French Revolution, the judges were dictatorial, corrupt, incompetent, and generally speaking, very obnoxious. And when the revolution came, that was all removed. They had a lot of serious problems deciding what to do with them. But the French system of having a panel of judges, uh, no precedence, so a decision by a panel of judges after the French Revolution had the same panel, was under no obligation to do the same thing next time. Um, and the idea was the legislator decides and the judge implements what the legislator does rather than correcting or altering or perverting what the legislator does, which is what the pre-revolutionary judges did. Mm -hmm. So that's where the canon law structure of no precedence, apart from the Roman Rota or the Signature, and panels of judges and review, that's where that comes from. In the French and continental European system, there are very similar tribunals to our signatura. They're called typically cassation or something similar. They do exactly the same thing. They don't redo the case. They look to see if the case was done properly. Mm -hmm. And they will, write, they will write and say, you didn't do it right, do it properly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in Canada, this exactly the same process is done with our our. High, high courts of record, the Queen's Bench Court in Saskatchewan. If I go to the Workers' Compensation Board uh, and they do something weird, I appeal within the Workers' Compensation System. If I don't like the result, I go to the Court of Queen's Bench. And the Court of Queen's Bench will, will very carefully say, we don't know anything about Workers' Compensation, that's what the Board's for, but the Board did not follow proper procedure, blah, 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 and it says, to the board, go and do it again properly. So that's, that's the same thing. Okay, that's basically all I have to say. Did any of it make any sense? Very, very, yeah, making sense. Okay. Yeah, you, so your main job is just observations, what you see in yeah. both, in both. Right. Plan, uh, plaintiff and, yeah. and, and, uh, and respondents, yeah. Do, um, do the witnesses, do, how do they know things? Right? Exactly, yeah. Often they will sound off, and to me there are three levels of mm -hmm. knowledge. Yeah. The first one is something you saw or heard. Mm -hmm. 
The second thing is something you saw and heard and then you interpreted it. Yeah. And the third one is you make an overview. And the example I always give, which is in that memo, yeah. is um, somebody's drunk at a wedding reception. Chaps all the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Witness says, I saw John drink six beers in half an hour, right? Yeah. No judge can possibly dispute that, right? Because the judge wasn't there. Yeah. And then the next level is, I saw uh, John was drunk at the wedding reception, to which I say, I don't know whether that means anything, right? Mm -hmm. And then the witness says, John is a drunk. Now there, in those second two, the judge is perfectly at liberty to dismiss what the witness says, because the judge operates on the closest to seen events. Right? Yeah. And again, it's exactly the same in the, in the civil law. Um, uh, courts of appeal in yeah. the civil law. Um, oh, excuse me. Okay. Do you want me to disappear? <laughs> it doesn't work. Oh, okay. wait. Sorry. Basically, you know, yeah. everything, um, it's clear, it's clear, you know, I know your job and then I yeah, should I keep this? Sure, okay, it's so all, I can, all for you to keep. I can go through. And I'm care uh, please understand, I'm not saying these are the best possible observations, right? Okay, yeah. I, I'm not saying that at all. Mm -hmm. I'm simply saying that's what I've done. These ex are examples of what I do, mm -hmm. but because I was a, a civil lawyer many years ago, Yeah. Uh, and I see the two systems. I obviously see things differently. Mm -hmm. um, if the judge, if I get response from the appeal tribunal, these observations are not helpful, blah, 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 mm -hmm. then I'm, you know, I'll correct it. Uh, so essentially, I'm not saying these are perfect observations. I'm not saying that at all. Yeah. I'm simply saying these are types of what I've done and why I've done them. Okay? Yeah. So you have to go away. I won't keep you.